tonight on At Discovery Canada, a rare disability sheds light on ability. How could Williams syndrome keep people from feeding themselves but allow them to play the clarinet? Finding a fingerprint for breast cancer, how two Calgary schoolgirls wowed their science fair and cancer researchers with their prize-winning project. Splendid isolation, why the female hornbill agrees to be locked up so that she can hatch her eggs. Arriving for work in style, Canadian astronaut Chris Hadfield takes one step closer to history. Hello and welcome to At Discovery Canada, I'm Patty Kim. And I'm Jay Ingram, also on the show tonight, Fact or Fiction. We'll hear two conflicting views of the origins of an ancient artifact. You have to decide which one's the truth. But first, a selective affliction helps scientists map the brain. Imagine being able to play the clarinet, but not to tie your shoes. To remember the lyrics to pop songs, but forget how to count to ten. That's the fate of some people with an unusual disorder. And now some new research into what patients can and can't do is giving scientists a rare glimpse into some of the brain's previously hidden secrets. Lisa Walsh is 22 years old. Her world is a paradox. She can't tie her shoes, yet she can pick out a tune on the piano. She has no concept of time or how to count to 10, but can keep musical time, tapping her foot to music and clapping a perfect musical rhythm. Back streets, back, all right. She also has a love and a gift for music. Lisa suffers from a neurogenetic developmental disorder called Williams Syndrome. It's a rare disease that affects about 1 in 20,000 people. Scientists know that people with Williams are missing one of two sets of genes on chromosome 7. The result is a lack of motor skills, a distinctive set of facial features like high cheekbones and turned up noses, and a low IQ. But what piques some scientists' interest is the fact that language and musical abilities are spared in people with Williams syndrome. There's an interesting um, lesson for us here to learn as scientists about the way the brain is wired up and the way the mind works and the relationship between mind and brain and genes. And with Williams syndrome we have the first opportunity to really trace uh, the path and make the links between uh, how the genes influence the development of the brain and how the brain influences the mind. Professor Dan Levitin is uniquely qualified to study Williams syndrome. He's an assistant professor in psychology and an associate member of the music faculty at McGill University in Montreal. He spent several years in the recording industry in Los Angeles and for the last 10 years has incorporated his musical expertise into his work with neuropsychology. Part of that research is devoted to getting a better picture of the Williams syndrome brain. It's interesting because um, it challenges a notion of what it means to have an ability. Um, when so much in Williams uh, has been compromised or is, is um, so much of what they're able to do or un unable to do has been influenced by the, uh, um, the genetic and, and neural profile, with music to be so much intact is really a, an intriguing puzzle for a neuropsychologist. How is it that the brain can do this, but not so many other things that would seem to be related? We see other Williams who can't get food from their plate to their mouth without spilling it because they can't move the fork. But in the next breath, they can play the clarinet with two hands, a relatively complicated passage. So whatever it is that's going on in motor cortex that allows them to play the clarinet. For some reason, they're not able to instruct it to do very important things like feeding themselves or you know, buttoning a sweater, hanging a sweater on a hanger. That's tough. Is it finished? Yeah. Yeah? Does it look like the other one? <laughs> no. You want to try again? Dan's work with Lisa is trying to gain a better understanding of those contradictions. When I say, I'll say start, and then put it there for exactly one second, and then take it away. Okay, not yet. Ready? Ready. Go.
great. And how many hours are there in the day? Do you know? No. Uh, how long does it watch, take to watch your favorite TV program? An hour. And how long did um, your favorite Stevie Wonder song last? An hour, I guess. Yeah. Lisa's parents say that she was taught how to count in school and learned about the hours in a day, but her brain has never retained that knowledge. But Professor Levitin says there's something going on in Lisa's brain that has preserved time and memory in a musical sense. She's committed words of songs to memory and remembers the musical key and tempo. I just called to say I love you. After a Williams syndrome person dies, um, an examination of the brain reveals a lot about the structure of the brain. And what we know from the few brains that we've been able to examine that way is that um, they have some structural features that are quite different from a typically developing normal brain. There are, are far fewer folds. Uh, if you, you know, a typical brain is, is really a crumpled mass of folds and peaks and valleys. It looks a lot like a, a prune, uh, and they have far fewer folds in their brain. And the um, uh, layers of the cortex seem to be structured differently. One part of the brain that seems to be structured differently is the cerebellar vermis located in the cerebellum. Some of it is smaller, some of it larger than normal. This is a key area in Levitin's studies. So one possibility, although we don't know for sure, is that their brains uh, are built differently and maybe even wired differently. We're just beginning to do functional uh, studies where we bring them into the brain scanner and we try to figure out which areas of the brain are active during certain cognitive processes. And this will help us to understand better whether they use their auditory cortex in the same way we do. Uh, do, they, do they have other centers of motor control outside the, what we think of as the normal motor cortex? Those preliminary brain scans show some intriguing results. Dr. Levitin and his colleagues wanted to know what was going on in Williams syndrome brains when subjects listened to familiar music. The scans of these two people show brain activity taking place in that differently structured area called the cerebellar vermis. Scientists believe this region of the brain is the gateway to emotion and that it has strong connections throughout the entire brain. In the same study of normal brains, there was no activation in the cerebellar vermis only a slight bit of activation in the frontal lobe, a region associated with memory. The connection with music in the brain's emotional center in Williams syndrome may explain why these individuals are so passionate about music. I was a musician. I went to music summer camp and to uh, these, these sort of musical retreats or master classes with other elementary school and teenage musicians. And, um, you know, we were real music geeks. I was a clarinet player, a saxophone player, and we would talk music all day long, and we'd have these rehearsals all, all through the, the camp session. But that was, we were nothing compared to these kids. I mean, we wish we could have been as uninhibited as they are. For scientists like Dan Levitin, there are still more questions than answers about Williams syndrome. One of the most intriguing questions is whether or not music can teach motor skills that are otherwise not musical to people like Lisa. For example, could tying shoes be easier if she did it in time to a song? If they can set these motor action sequences to music and they know the music and then just associate a particular movement, why should tying the shoe be more difficult than playing the clarinet or the piano? Um, they learn that when they want to create a certain sound, their finger has to do this and then this and then this on the piano. Um, and presumably they're matching these movements to a sound that's in their head. So if they can learn a song uh, in their head and just um, you know, link other movements, like tying the shoe, buttoning a sweater, or moving a fork, I don't see why that wouldn't work. We just haven't looked at it yet. I just called. In a life that's filled with contradictions, Lisa is adamant about her likes and dislikes. She says she's living her dream of singing and performing. And perhaps she's also giving science an insight into ourselves. Baby, I'm a part. Wow. Thank you.